because we will start just around that. And I will welcome up on stage Emma Olnes Fors from Man uh, Mannheimer Svartling. Thank you. An applause for Emma. And we will just kind of, of go into, you will have a session looking at um, how a just transition can become reality and really looking at the uh, fossil free and just electrification of the society and how that can be achieved. And you have, uh, I know with you as well later, uh, a number of companies that are going to talk about that as well. Exactly. But you are setting the stage a little bit beforehand. I will do my best. Thank you so much. Great. So I will leave this for you in your capable hands. Thank you. I think I will stand over here. I need my paper somewhere. So good morning, everyone. My name is Emma Fors, and I am a lawyer and a partner at the Swedish law firm Mannheim Svortling, based here in Gothenburg. I co-chair our energy practice group, but in contrast to our panelists, who you will soon meet, I am not focused on sustainability as such. I am, in fact, an M&A lawyer, a deal doer, uh, buying and selling companies and assets. However, my work is, of course, a mirror of the movements within our commercial and political context. What that means is that I am a very active cog in the wheel that drives the energy transition. I see the transition in its project form. The buying, the selling, the reshaping of companies, stepping up to make the changes that we need. I do a lot of work in the renewable space and a robust supply of renewable energy is essential for the just transition. It will take significant international coordination to expand and diversify manufacturing capacity globally to achieve this. It will also require greater investments, including in education, skills training, research and innovation and incentives to create supply chains through sustainable practices to protect ecosystems and cultures. Big, but necessary goals. Before we dive into our panel discussions this morning, it is helpful to set the scene by taking a step back. Our topic today is just transition and the role of business. What is this all about and what exactly is a just transition? In a way, it is a recognition of Newton's third law. For every action, there is an equal and an opposite reaction. It is an acknowledgement that a transition to a net zero economy requires moving away from one thing to another. That evolution is not pain free. For some, this is obvious. For others, it is irrelevant given the importance of the goal, but for all, it should be recognized and managed. So how do we do this? We manage it through a just transition. To drastically reduce the amount of greenhouse gases we emit into the atmosphere, to uphold the Paris Agreement from 2015, the world must transform. This increased investment in non-fossil fuel sources of energy will reshape our economies and spur innovation of new business. This is the transition part, but the just part is to ensure that people are placed front and center of that transition. There are of course winners from an energy transition. Some will be able to access new jobs in the green economy, and some people would make money investing in green tech. But there will also be losers. And by that I mean people who will lose out because of the transition itself. It's different from talking about the people losing out because of climate warming. As companies start to take actions to reduce their emissions, divesting out of certain sectors, investing into renewables, mining the minerals needed, etc., Great green gains can be made in both the dollar and the climate, but people are also impacted. Some are impacted as we transition out of something, and others are impacted as we transition in to something else. To break this down a little, let's start with a transition out. 
According to some estimates, 5 million people will lose their jobs as we transition into new net zero scenario. For example, those working in oil, gas and coal. Communities who are reliant on the fossil fuel economy will of course also be impacted. On the flip side, there are also estimated that there will be 14 million new jobs in and around clean energy. But those new jobs won't necessarily impact and benefit the same regions and the same communities and the same people. In other words, on a human level, it's not a straight swap between losing a job and getting a new one. When it comes to the transition in, we already see impacts, in particular in terms of access of land. Land that is needed to install wind turbines, solar panels, mine the minerals and the like. This can impact indigenous peoples in particular. We must also consider labor issues. Just think about cobalt, needed for electrical car batteries, often sourced from the Democratic Republic of Congo, where child labor in mines is a real risk. Just because an activity is green doesn't mean that it is socially sound. The classic E and S clash of the ESG acronym. Checks and balances are needed. A just transition is needed. And don't forget cost and accessibility. Some green products are more expensive than their traditional counterparts. Take efficient appliances and electrical costs. Will this mean that certain people are excluded from new markets? With an ongoing cost of Christ living crisis, people who are already most vulnerable stand to lose out the most. None of these factors mean that we should not fully focus on the transition needed. Of course not. However, the just in a just transition means considering all of these people in how we move forward to a net zero future. Integrating them fully, workers and communities, rooting the transition in respect of human rights, ensuring that the movement away from fossil fuels to green energy is done in a fair way, without leaving anyone behind. Companies who manage their social and environmental impacts will enjoy better stakeholder relationship and a stronger license to operate. Alongside just mitigation of impacts, this also manages a number of financially material risks, including legal and reputational risks. There is no one here today, I assume, that would disagree with the principle of a just transition. There is less understanding around how to achieve this, how to ensure rights are respected, how to make difficult choices and mitigate any negative impacts on people. How to wield the responsibility of the transition in a just way. Building relationships with communities where operations take place, empowering, educating and strengthening the resilience of local communities. How to do effective due diligence and impact assessments. We will dig in to some of these topics today with our panel. In summary, a just transition works to ensure that transition to net zero emissions and the climate resilience is orderly, inclusive and just. Create decent work opportunities and leave no one behind. This depends on a fair process built on social dialogue, stakeholder engagement and the universal respect for fundamental labor rights and other human rights. So, having that said, I will now invite our panelists up to the scene and I will step over to this corner. First off is Joel Fritjof, talking on the phone, no, he's ready, Lead Sustainability Advisor and Program Lead at Ørsted. Ørsted is a leading player within the renewable sector and the world's largest developer of offshore wind power. Welcome. Thank you. Second is Karin Svensson, Chief Sustainability Officer at Volvo Group, one of the world's leading providers of trucks, 
buses, construction equipments and industrial engines with production facilities in 19 countries, but headquartered here in Gothenburg. Veli Matti Hilla, Chief Sustainability Officer at Terra Farm Limited, a company situated in the middle of Finland, not far away from the Russian border and with the world's largest production lines for chemicals such as nickel and cobalt. And finally, Melanie Moore, Vice President ESG at Wilhelmsen, a comprehensive global maritime group providing products and services <coughs> along with supplying crew and technical management to the largest and most complex vessels in the world. Welcome. <laughs> Do you want the panelists over there? Ma yeah, maybe just to rearrange a bit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. <coughs> Great. So everyone is ready? Let's kick off then. Joel, let's start with you. At Ørsted, you have a vision that the world should run entirely on green energy, and studies show that the renewable energy technologies that exist today are cheaper than fossil fuels, but need to be put into work at scale and speed. Such development will, however, require that the minerals needed to produce wind turbines and electricity networks are extracted in a sustainable way. So, at Arset, you have developed a metals and minerals program, which is scoped around 10 metals used in turbines, foundations, solar panels, and energy storage system. Tell us more about that and how that affects you in your daily work and how it moves us to a just transition. Yes, yes, I can, I can answer that. Uh, so, thank you all for the invite and, and, and thank you, thank you for, uh, for listening. So, uh, I work at Ørsted. Um, as you said, our vision is, uh, is a world that runs entirely on green electricity. And the last 15 years, we worked hard uh, to move from one of the most fossil-intensive energy companies in Europe to being a green energy leader. And we have the ambition uh, for 2030 to be the global uh, leading uh, green major in the, in the world. Obviously, that transition comes with a lot of challenges. And we within Ørsted have identified in our global sustainability team key challenges in order to meet those proactively, act proactively on those topics in order to make this renewable energy transition a just transition, as you say. So some of the topics that we have identified are supply chain decarbonization, uh, biodiversity, but also metals and minerals. And on that last one, I, I would like to elaborate a bit. So. First of all, why is a company such as Ørsted even interested into, into metal supply chains? That's because metal supply chains are very important for our renewable energy products. Um, our renewable energy products are dependent on a specific set of metals. As you, as you said, we identify 10 metals. And it takes more metals to produce renewable energy solutions than it takes to, produ to produce fossil-based uh, um, energy production. Um, it takes approximately 13 times more metals to build an offshore wind farm compared to a gas-fired power plant of a similar capacity. If you then take into account that the rollout of renewable energy that is needed in order to, me in order to combat climate change and biodiversity loss is immense. So we're all the world is going to need a whole lot of these metals going forward. So existing mines need to be ramped up and there need to be new mines uh, uh, put, in, put into operations shortly. If you then take into account, mining in, in itself is a, is, is a, is a high-risk sector. Uh, it's destructive by, uh, uh, by nature. Obviously, it can be done well, but by nature, it's, it's destructive. And it's, in uh, generally speaking, high-risk countries, meaning there's a lot of social and environmental risks in our supply chain of these metals. And we within Ørsted feel that the renewable energy transition should not come at the expense of human rights in our own company, in our projects, but also not in our supply chain. So that's why we developed the Metals and Minerals program. But it's also a huge challenge because we are one of the end users here. We have very low leverage and we are looking to a supply chain that is very long, very complex and very opaque. So, but we still want to be part of that solution. So that's why we developed the Metals and Minerals program. And very briefly, we're working on two sides of supply chain. First, 
we're setting up dialogues with our first tier suppliers. So I'm in dialogue with 17 of our key strategic large suppliers of foundations, cables, etc., because they are procuring these metals, not directly. That dialogue is very much about planting the seeds and setting the agenda, saying this is a very important topic for us, a topic that we want to push forward. At the same time, we're also mapping the performance of these uh, of our suppliers to the OECD guidelines. And as I'm sure you can imagine, there's a lot that's happening on policies and management systems in place. But as soon as, start, uh, as I start asking number two, have you mapped your supply chain? Have you identified risks? And what are you doing to mitigate them? The valuable information tracks off very quickly. And the answers I'm getting is, I also don't know where this uh, stuff is coming from. I want to take stats, but I, know, I don't know why. I'm buying this on the market, which is intransparent. I, this, is, this is still five tiers down the supply chain. So that lack of transparency is the first thing we're trying to tackle with our first tier suppliers. But we don't want to wait for that in order to move down the supply chain or upwards to the supply chain to the mining companies. So we are also collaborating at a mine level. Uh, at the end of last year, we joined the Initiative for Responsible Mining Assurance, IRMA, as the first energy company globally. And what we want to do there, IRMA uh, is a truly multi-stakeholder initiative which has the, what I consider the most aspirational mining code uh, globally, and they are auditing mines, assessing mines, and certifying mines. So we as a company, as an end user, can learn what does it actually mean to do responsible mining? And how are the, how are the mines that, that are extracting the materials that are relevant for us as a company, lithium, copper, how are they performing and what are the common issues that they are running into? And at the same time, Irma also has what they call a buyer's panel. So I'm sitting in a group together with other, with other, um, uh, with other sectors. So I'm sitting together with the Teslas, with the Volkswagens as well, trying to learn from them, as well as the Tiffany and companies and, and, the, and the Microsoft. I'm trying to learn from these other industries because they have trying to tackle this issue for 10 plus years already. I don't want to reinvent the wheel. This is a new topic for us, but not for the others in the room. So we are trying to learn from them as well. So by coming at it, coming at it from both sides of the supply chain, we're trying to take concrete action in, in what is going to be a very long, uh, very long uh, discussion, I think, because this is a very difficult thing to topic, but something that we are very committed on uh, in trying to address, just to make sure, and again, that that renewable and uh, <coughs> transition will be a just transition. Thank you. Thank you, Joel. And talking about mining, uh, Velimatti, Terrafame has constructed the world's largest production lines for battery chemicals, such as nickel and cobalt, which are used in electrical ve uh, vehicle batteries. The carbon footprint of the nickel sulfate produced by Terrafame is among the lowest in the industry. Tell us about the measures that you have taken to reduce your footprint and uh, how you work in your mine. Thank you, and uh, th thanks for inviting me to this uh, event. So, Terraforma is a multi-metal company, Finnish company, who is producing uh, nickel, uh, zinc, uh, copper, and uh, cobalt in uh, Finland. In uh, one side, so we are one-side company. Uh, we have an integrated process where we have all process steps from mining to battery chemicals, all in the same place, in the same site. And uh, we are using a bioheap leaching for nickel production and this is unique concept because bioheap leaching it's a process which is used mainly for gold and copper production but our case we are using that for nickel production and uh, when we look at this setup we can say that uh, for example sustainability in general human rights uh, traceability they are very high level because we are operating in Finland and we have just uh, one site. For example, cobalt, it's coming from our own mine. Uh, and uh, when we look at uh, carbon footprint, uh, of course, this one site setup is uh, good for carbon footprint because there's no that kind of a long distance transport in between process steps. But the main reason for good result uh, related carbon footprint is that bioheap leaching. So because we're using bioheap leaching, mm -hmm. there are a couple of uh, advanced, for example, uh, material handling phase. We don't need uh, grinding after crushing. So particle size is uh, bigger than usually, which means that uh, less energy consumption in that phase. Uh, also, we don't need that kind of high temperature process steps. 
again energy savings. So overall we have a very energy efficient process which means that uh, our carbon footprint of our main product uh, which is uh, nickel sulfate is about 60 percent smaller than indu industry average and those results are coming from uh, LCI study which has done an external company uh, following those uh, ISO standards which are, are created for, for that area. Uh, so we have a very good uh, situation when we look at uh, uh, carbon footprint, carbon emission. Uh, we are happy about that and of course uh, we are happy that uh, also that is a great value for our customers. That's very good. So that's the situation in Terpa. Yeah, thank you so much. Very interesting. <coughs> Karin, Volvo Group has uh, launched various initiatives and programs uh, in order to be able to meet the requirements set out in the Paris Agreement. And one step that Volvo Group, um, as a customer, has taken is to become a member of the First Movers Coalition. Tell us a little bit more about the First Movers Coalition and how that helps you uh, in Volvo Group in your work. Thank you, Emma. <coughs> Let me maybe start by taking a step back. Uh, if we look upon our greenhouse gas emissions, and as you all know, the transport sector is emitting quite a lot of greenhouse gases. If we look upon it from a value chain perspective, actually as much as 95% of all the greenhouse gases we are em uh, emitting comes from the use phase. So when the products are in use during the full lifetime. 4% of our emissions comes from upstream, from the supply chain, uh, materials that we buy or transports that we buy. And then less than a percent comes from our own operation. You might think that that would have been much bigger, but it's actually less than a percent that comes from our own production or the electricity that we buy. And that's really the part that we as a company directly can impact. Uh, today, we sell something like 1% of all our products, they are electric products. But really, in order to help society and to help our customers, electrification and the broad rollout of electric products, that's really the key for us to, to reduce these 95% of all emissions. So we have since many years, since over 10 years, been delivering electric buses. We are also selling and delivering both trucks, electric trucks and construction uh, equipment machines. But today it's maybe around 1% of the total sales. In 2030, we have as a goal that this should be 35% of everything we sell. So in eight years, we will go from 1% to 35% around the globe. And that will require some work from us. But, but that's another story. But when we are increasing the number of electric vehicles, the percentage, the 95% will of course go down. And what we then will see is that the 4% from the supply chain, that will most probably go up. Exactly as you will said, it has a, a larger CO2 footprint to uh, produce electric vehicles than sort of regular vehicles. So therefore, we felt it was very important for us to focus not only on our own part, but also on the supply chain. And one way for us to handling that, that was to take part in an initiative called the First Movers Coalition. This was launched last year at COP26 in Glasgow. Uh, it's an initiative launched by the World Economic Forum together uh, with um, uh, President Biden in the US. Uh, it has over 50 members. I just spoke to Maersk at my table. They are also a member together with Amazon, Apple and some other major players in the world. There is also, I think, nine countries, among them Sweden, also being a member in this coalition. Um, and really what the First Movers Coalition does is to bring together companies that have a very carbon intense supply chain and the aim is really for us to utilize our purchasing power to make sure that we can bring technologies that are today just in the development phase into the market in maybe 10 years from now. Today we can say that 50% of all the technologies that are needed in order for the world to become 
to become net zero by 2050, they are just in the development phase or even in the prototype phase. And somehow we need to make sure that these technologies actually come to market and then someone needs to, to take the risk really to say that I'm prepared to pay a little bit extra to get fossil free steel to my trucks, as an example. So the First Movers Coalition are focusing on seven sectors. It's steel, aluminium, concrete, chemicals, trucking, shipping, aviation. So it's either materials or it's buying of transport of some kind. Um, and these sectors together, they actually stand for 30% of all the greenhouse gas emissions in the world. So it's really, really crucial to get that down. Um, and so for us in the Volvo Group, we have then committed to three sectors. We have committed to, sh uh, not shipping, <coughs> but to uh, trucking. <laughs> so we are one of, uh, we are a really, really big transport uh, producer, of course, but also a very big transport buyer. So we have promised that a certain level of all the transports that we are buying should be fossil free or ser zero emission really by 2030. We have also committed to aluminium and to uh, steel. So we will buy a certain level of fossil free steel in 2030, then to a premium price. But that we think is really, really important to get all players to get access to these really good materials. Hmm. Thank you, Karin. Uh, Joel, uh, you mentioned Irma, but having listened to Karin and the Volvo Group's co engagement in the First Movers Coalition, a more extensive international mm. uh, collaboration between actors seems to be necessary in order to meet the requirements. What kind of initiative would you like to see in your space? Mm. Yeah, I, th I think that's great. Urset is also uh, is, is part of the steel, uh, the steel group in that one, and, uh, and I definitely support that one. Uh, but more broadly, uh, I, I think international and cross-sectorial um, uh, collaboration is, uh, is, is very much needed. Um, individual companies uh, can set and push the agenda, but if you want to have an impact on the, on the sector, you need to collaborate with, uh, with uh, participants in the, in the full sector in order to push everything forward. I have a very long list when it comes to metals and minerals in terms of collaboration, but just focusing on two. Uh, the first one is a collaboration across sectors which are using these, uh, these same metals. Uh, as I already mentioned, this renewable, sustainable metal supply chains is very much a new topic for, uh, for Ørsted, but it's not a new topic for automotive industry amongst others, but even more importantly, the gemstone industry as well as the, um, as well as the electronics industry. And we don't need to reinvent the wheel. We don't want to reinvent the wheel. We want to know what are the main hurdle blocks that have already been, uh, been covered by the others, and we want the others to be open for any new thinking ar around, uh, around this area. And that type of collaboration collaboration with the automotive industry for nickel and lithium for example or the construction uh, when it comes to iron and for copper where the renewable energy does use a lot of a uh, lot of uh, metals we should be open to collaborate uh, collaborate with others so there's one across sector at the end user then the other one is a collaboration between end users and mining companies. Uh, for us as an end user, it's quite difficult to push things on the supply chain and having an outreach from the mining companies at the other side of the supply chain makes such efforts very, uh, very workable. It's also something I've done in, 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 my, in my previous job, working with mining companies, seeing how we can collaborate from both sides of the supply chain and, and, and trying to do that. I think that's beneficial for mining companies, because we as end users can create a market for responsibly mined materials, as well as making, uh, making it very clear <coughs> what do we mean by responsibly mined materials. And for us, it's, it's very convenient if we have a mining company to collaborate with, for example, on those, on those transparency issues that we see going forward. So those are just two of the, uh, two of the uh, initiatives we see going on, on on collaboration. I do think there's a lot of Good things already happening, uh, but I do feel that some of these collaborations don't fully come to fruition because there's too much mushrooming of these collaborations. So very much broadening existing collaboration rather than starting uh, starting up new ones. Okay, thank you so much, <coughs> Melanie Wilhelmsen was founded in Norway in <coughs> 1861. And despite its great history, Wilhelmsen is now a company with a strong commitment to shape and reshape the maritime industry in many ways. Um, a robust supply of renewable energy and disruption of existing energy chains are essential for the just 
transition, and there is a great focus on electrification, supply of batteries, and the need for new infrastructure for uh, electric charging stations, etc. But how does all this fit into the maritime industry? Yeah, well, first of all, <coughs> I'd just like to echo the sentiments that it will take all of us together to make the transitions that are required across industry and for society as a whole. Uh, in shipping today, 99% of the ships sailing the seas, whether it's short sea or whether it's uh, out there on the wider oceans, 99% run on conventional fuel. So that means only 1% of the total world fleet have actually made some type of transition to alternative fuels. So you can imagine the amount of shift required, the amount of partnerships, all of the collaboration required within shipping, energy providers, other value chain partners, including all the way through to the customers that is going to be required in the next couple of decades. The lifetime of a ship is typ typically around 25 to 30 years. So you can imagine whilst we're trying to transition, we're also trying to account for the ships that are currently out there sailing the seas. So that's one part of our, our uh, exciting future ahead. It's a great place to be. If any of you have kids, send them our way, train them <laughs> up, get them through uh, colleges, technical skills or universities and send them towards the maritime industry. We need everybody there. Um, another complexity of the shipping environment is that we have these different types of ships. So you see them, ferries, passenger ships, cargo ships, tankers, etc., all having different needs and requirements for what they carry, whether it's people or oil or containers or whatever. So that affects the types of designs and also how much fuel they can carry and built into the design of the vessel. So that's a significant, again, another transition we have to go through is how do we find the right types of energy carriers to be able to account for all of these complex vessel types out there. Uh, in addition, um, you would think that maybe one day we could uh, put a big battery on board each ship and plug in when we come into port and then go to another port and plug in, etc. And that might be the case for some of these shorter transit zones. So a ferry going between two places, going there two times a day, moving backward and forward. So that, that's likely and a possibility to use some good battery technology and plug in at shore. But there are other ships that will do global world trade. And some of them are on a consistent route going to the same types of ports around the world and running around like a milk route. But some of them don't. So they need to have the flexibility, the energy, the fuel flexibility to be able to go to port A one day and then over to port Z another day, another day and then over to port G another day. So the complexity of shipping is that we need to have energy sources and energy carriers positioned around the world in all of these uh, various countries where we're providing services, whether it's cargo or moving people, etc. So the, the challenge is, is quite yeah. large um, for us to take on. Um, another thing to do with energy and, and why we need to work a lot with uh, the energy sector and also the new energy providers and renewables in particular is because taking something like renewable and trying to put it into a carrier that we can use on board vessels, you might get a lot of inefficiency in what ends up being able to be used. So imagine if we take a nice clean renewable energy from our offshore wind, we bring it into shore, we turn it into something that ships can use. By the time it gets to the propeller, when we're actually using it to churn and move across the oceans, we've lost at least 80% of that energy. So again, what is the most efficient, effective use of energy in a system approach, not just shipping, but who might be better off using that type of electricity, for example? So shore-based for cars, all of that type of thing. Um, when it comes to just transition, how does this affect that? Well, what we'll see is that particularly um, countries like us here in the Nordics um, that have access to resources uh, where there is the right type of regulatory approach and policy approach from governments, we will move faster into new energy sources and new energy carriers. So you'll expect that that will happen um, in regions like here, and then we also have Singapore is another big region that we, we work in in particular as well. 
So there'll be spots of transition and energy both sources and, and carriers being made available and companies located in those regions will move a little bit faster. But they need to because we need to get things churning in order to then be able to transfer that knowledge and technology, etc., to other parts of the world. So that's just a, uh, a light yeah. perspective on, <laughs> on shipping and maritime. So everybody welcome, please, to the maritime sector. Thank you so much, Melanie. Yeah, collaboration seems to be key <coughs> here. Um, Veli Matti, at Tara, uh, Tara Farmers, you uh, seem to operate in a very unique way with a very um, a low carbon footprint. However, I understand that you have plans to further reduce your carbon footprint and achieve a carbon neutral production by 2039. So can you elaborate on what additional measures you plan to take in order to achieve that? Yes, we have a set uh, target for carbon neutral production uh, 2039, like you mentioned, and uh, it's a, a tough target, but uh, we take that seriously. And we are already listed quite many actions related to that. And uh, if I mention a couple of those, uh, first one is of course that we have to decrease or avoid uh, fossil fuels, mainly in uh, our mining operation uh, related transporting ore and waste rock. That is the big issue. Mm -hmm. So electrification or some kind of other other uh, actions are coming related that it can be hydrogen solution also but that is the big action maybe the biggest and uh, uh, when I mentioned hydrogen one issue is that uh, we are using hydrogen in our process which is based on propane at the moment so the idea is that in coming years we will produce green hydrogen in our site and uh, there can be other solutions also related that, and not just to our process. Uh, and many other smaller actions are already listed, and actually some of those are already done. Uh, done. Uh, for example, our steam and uh, heat production is based on wood-based uh, bioenergy at the moment. Earlier it was uh, fossil fuels. So. Uh, that kind of actions and uh, it's clear that uh, electricity consumption will increase rabi rapidly when we will take those uh, actions. And uh, our idea is that uh, our electricity consumption in future based on solar energy, which is produced inside of our industry area and wind power, which is uh, pro produced uh, surrounding us, so nearby us, a site. Uh, but of course, because we have a continuous process, we have to buy electricity from uh, uh, Finnish national grid and uh, we are happy that uh, we have a nuclear power in Finland, uh, we have some hydropower also, so we need that kind of a st stable carbon-free energy mm. in, in this kind of uh, industry. Thank you so much. Um, Melanie, we understand that Wilhelmsen uh, is focusing on creating new uh, opportunities and collaborations um, in, among other things, renewables, uh, but also within the zero emission uh, industry. In fact, you have established a segment within the group that you call New Energy. Uh, tell us about that and, and how, what the purpose is with the New Energy segment. So this was just in the last couple of years because we, we see the, uh, the risk of the transition uh, for the maritime industry and for all the value chain partners and we also see the significant opportunities ahead and I'm sure a lot of companies also see that as well. So the new energy segment is all about looking at how do we decarbonise the maritime industry and what type of different roles can we play in the different value chains of which there are many um, using our competence and experience from the past, putting people on vessels, building vessels, uh, working with vessels for our 160 uh, years in the past. So that's sort of the, the genesis for the new energy group. Um, so there was a commitment made that we would look at an initial starting fund of around 500 million to start building up a portfolio of companies within that new energy segment. And I think the guys have spent about 200 million already in the last couple of years. And what we're looking to do is to buy into or support scale up companies so that we can build into three particular areas. One is purely focused on decarbonisation and zero emission ships. 
So how can we actually support ship owners, ship operators, value chain partners, cargo owners in building these types of vessels for the future? Another area we've entered to is in offshore wind as well, both providing technical services to offshore wind installations, whatever those services might be, and also looking at using our current um, assets and infrastructure to eventually look at offshore, offshore wind, actually wind farms. And then the third one that we're looking at is about infrastructure in general. So how do we make sure that if we need all of this type of energy sources, all these energy carriers, and we need to distribute them and get them to the right place at the right time for the right use, how might we participate in that from an infrastructure perspective? So really using a skill set that we've had and also skill sets that we, we buy in um, through some of these companies to really build up a, a portfolio of companies that will help aid the transition for the decarbonisation of maritime. Mm. So when we think about Wilhelmsen as a shipping <laughs> company, that's not really correct. That is not correct. So that's been our past and that's been a lot of the competence that we have in the bank, if you like. And then how do we actually use that to, to whether it's called pivoting or whether it's to add more value to more value chains that we can see. Um, that's really where we want to position ourselves. Mm. Thank you so much. Um, Joel, talking about new initiatives, um, one good practice or initiatives that you mentioned to me is the, um, the, um, the, the blockchain technology that you would like to use more um, in relation to, to supply chains and so on. For me as a lawyer, that's a bit complicated. Can you maybe tell us what you think that blockchain technology could help you in a just transition? Yeah, I, and I'm by no means a blockchain expert, but um, if I look in the market, uh, blockchain holds great promise. It, it, uh, it could provide a, a, a full uh, supply chain which is auditable, which is fully transparent, and which is not corruptible. So from that perspective, it's, it, it's, it's almost a silver bullet if you look at what actually do you want to track in your supply chains. And you can do that from the extraction of a metal to the decommissioning to the circular economy. You would be able to, prov to provide a ledger uh, to follow that material all the way to the to the supply chain to understand whatever you want to put in the ledger. That can be an equality, any quantity, specifications of a product, but also in my case, what are the responsible business conducts that are coming with this? Is this actually responsibly mined? Is this coming from from non uh, from conflict-free smelters, for example? So in that sense, blockchain has a really great potential. It still has a bit of issues and. Uh, the first one, part of my French, is crap in, crap out. It's c very hard to make sure that whatever is entered to the into the blockchain is done in an auditable way, in a way that makes sense, in a way that's truthful of actually the extraction of this. That's especially relevant for metals and minerals because the large volumes of uh, of the volumes that of the metals that we use in our renewable energy products is coming from artisanal, small scale, and sometimes even illegal mining. So these have no these stakeholders have no incentive at all to provide a fully transparent and, and good ledger in, in that sense. I think the second one, if you look at responsible supply chains, to my knowledge, there's only two companies which are trying to do these type, uh, these type of work in the, in the supply chain in order to make responsible, uh, responsible mining a reality through blockchain. So that makes it also very difficult. And my last comment, I, I do think blockchain would provide, a, uh, would provide a great ledger, but we need to have a discussion on what you put in that ledger. I think transparency should never be an end goal of something. Transparency, I understand the call that we get from our shareholders, that we get from our stakeholders, from politicians and media. Obviously, we need to work towards transparency, but what are you going to do with that? We, within Erstead for Metals and Minerals, want to use that transparency in order to push changes in that supply chain when it comes to responsible mining practices. And again, there we need to learn from others which have already conducted pilots uh, in this. I know that Volvo did some great work when it comes to cobalt. I know uh, Volkswagen did some great work when it comes to lithium. Again, we need to learn there, and we are exploring how we can apply this um, also mining companies are starting to use this, so again, from both sides of the supply chain. So we need to do a pilot on this as well and learn from the ones that are already in place, but it holds great promise. Okay, good to hear. Just transition is about how we ensure that the movement away from fossil fuels to green energy is made in a fair way, without leaving anyone behind. 
But as we embark on the green and digital transition, millions of jobs related to making high emission vehicles, for example, will need to be replaced, displaced. A majority of these may be offset by gains of jobs uh, in the EV manufacturing or similar job opportunities. But this requires that employees are offered training and are reskilled. Karin. Large companies like Volvo Group are affected and need to monitor their job and skills demand and supply. You have uh, entered into an, a collaboration called Reskilling for Employment. Could you tell us a little bit more about that, please? Yes. Um, I think you explained it very well in your introduction, Emma, where you talked about that there will be a number of jobs that will disappear. Uh, and there will also be a number of new jobs and somewhere in between there uh, needs to be some kind of reskilling. So I think if we look upon it from our industry, we are in that lucky situation, you could say, that uh, we could in many cases keep work in the same sites at least, so they won't move that big from a geographical point of view. So for example, today we are producing electric trucks on the same production line in Tuve here in Gothenburg as we are producing diesel trucks. I think that's a very, uh, for us, that's a very good thing. We have a modular approach to how we both develop and produce vehicles, which makes it possible for us to do that step. We are also looking into for example, we have a big plant in Skövde here where we produce engines. We will, as some of you have probably seen, we are now uh, have the ambition to establish a battery plant in Maria Star, which is, is in the same neighborhood as Skövde, which also makes it possible to keep jobs in the same sort of region. So, so that's a starting point. Then, of course, for our own employees, we need to make sure that they have competence that is relevant not only today, but also during the transition and after the transition. So we work quite a lot with uh, internal training in different ways and make sure that um, our employees are ready. The third thing I want to mention from our own perspective, that is, of course, to have a close dialogue with our employees and with the unions. You mentioned to have a social dialogue in the beginning, and I think that's very, very important. So we work a lot with making sure that we are transparent what will happen, uh, how will this impact employees, etc. And I think that goes for our own employees, but it also goes for other people. You're, you reached out to get all the, uh, young people to go into shipping. I think we can say the same thing for trucking. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so uh, I think if we can sort of share our story about how interesting and attractive and engaging it is to be part of this industry, I think that's also something we can do. But coming then to the reskilling for employment uh, initiative, that's something that we do together with an organization called ERT, European Roundtable for Industry. It's an organization that consists of the 60 largest industry and technology companies in Europe. Um, and we have, of course, realized that in order for Europe then, because this organization is focused on Europe, to be able to go into the green and also digital transition, there is a lot of reskilling to be done. Studies show that approximately 20 million people in Europe needs to be reskilled in the coming years. So it's an enormous amount of people. I think you mentioned some other uh, numbers here, so also yeah, that I think uh, new jobs were 14 million. Yeah, new jobs, for example, yeah. five million will be out of job. And what we see today is that we have large groups that are actually unemployed. Mm -hmm. We have companies like ours that need competence and we can't find competence. So already today we have a big uh, sort of mismatch. And looking into the future, we see that we also have a g big competence or skills gaps that we need to close somehow. And then we were start thinking, how can we do this? In how can we do reskilling in maybe a little bit of a different way? And then we decided to take part of this initiative. And ERT then will run three pilots in Portugal, in Spain, and in Sweden. And here in Sweden, it's the Volvo Group together with AstraZeneca that will be in charge of the pilots. And it's really two things. One thing is that we will identify, but also inspire employees that are today in risk occupations to reskill. And that will be done by using different kind of data-driven tools. 
And the second thing is to improve employability of workers that are today in uh, at, uh, at risk in, in uh, some way. So uh, what we have done then within the Volvo Group as part of this initiative is that we have developed or further developed an initiative that we have run since 10 years called Volvo Steget or maybe Volvo Step in, in <laughs> English. Uh, this is a program that uh, has mainly been for youth, so uh, people between 18 and 23 years uh, of age. They should be unemployed uh, and be interested in going into different kind of industrial occupations. This is a one-year program where you combine practice and theory. Uh, we do not um, guarantee them a job at Volvo, but actually as many as 80% that have gone through this program get a job either at us or somewhere else, so we have a very, very good hit rate. Uh, now we want to take this Volvo Steget or the Volvo Step and broaden it a little bit. We will probably rename it, open up, make it shorter, five months, and we will do this together with um, Teknikföretagen. Uh, we are looking now for eight to ten companies to do a pilot on this to see how we can really make um, to combine then practice and theory and uh, in that way get people that are currently today unemployed to get them into different kind of uh, industrial jobs or mechanics etc so this is something that we will now focus on for the coming years wow impressive we're trying to cover many topics within, the, within this panel today so <coughs> from a global perspective mining companies Vellimati, are under increased pressure to assess the biodiversity risks across their businesses and will most likely be obliged to demonstrate that mines are considering the long-term impact on biodiversity being considered as nature positive mining companies by conserving and uh, rehabilitating forestry and, and so on. Are you considering any of those measures and wh what are you doing from your perspective in Finland? So we are, we are discussing about ecological compensation and it's uh, quite a new thing in Finland. It's uh, coming, it's developing quite fast and we have already some examples related to that, but it's not a common common system yet. And for example, our case, we have not that kind of a systematic ecological compensation in place. Of course, we are waiting for guidelines and after that we are looking how we can compensate and which kind of actions we have, have taken. At the moment, we think that the most important is that we are <coughs> minimizing those, those effects to uh, and emissions to air and uh, surface water, ground water and so on. So, so we are working uh, very hard in, in that area and, that, uh, and good results in that area. So we are concentrating that and look at what is the ecological compensation in the future. Mm. Thank you so much. Well, mindful of everyone's FICA time um, and inspired by my great colleague Sarah Hoskins, who is sitting at table four, head of sustainability at Mannheim Swartling. I have been inspired by her to ask the last question to <laughs> Melanie before we take our uh, Swedish FICA. Melanie, if uh, you could post one sentence on social media today, which the world would read right now, what would that be? <laughs> That's funny, because I don't post much at all. <laughs> 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 so I uh, probably wouldn't get read that much. But uh, I, I would use uh, the language, because it would have to stay for a while until the next post. Um, <laughs> I would try to pick something <laughs> timeless, and I would use... Um, a proverb from the language of my mother and then also my s myself, so Maori from New Zealand. And there was a famous proverb that ended with the answer that is te tangata, te tangata, te tangata. And the question that was asked is, what is the most important thing in the world? And it was repeated three times in the answer. It is the people, it is the people, it is the people. Wow, thank you that so much. Thank you. Uh, well, thanks to all our panelists. <laughs> thank you for listening. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Melanie. Thank you. Cecilia, would you like to come up again? Or? Thanks a lot. And now, Melanie, we will all follow you on social media now to wait for that post. So uh, go in and follow wherever you can find Melanie. You might have to go and create yourself a few accounts. <laughs> uh, 
great. Thanks a lot, uh, everyone, for, for really great insights. I learned a lot. I also got, I think we now have all of us, or are you only looking for young people? Otherwise, <laughs> I think maybe if some of us are, you know, transport seems really interesting, both shipping there and... There were a lot of people taking notes. Ah, okay, good, mm. good. Um, thanks a lot, Emma. And I think you. you got people enticed a little bit for Fika, but it's not Fika yet. Oh, sorry. Because obviously we want you also to think a little bit about what you just heard and also think a little bit about, uh, we talked about uh, electrification, uh, complex um, uh, supply chains. Uh, and what does this look like in your context where you work, in your company? And what are some of the, the uh, risks that you have um, in these areas in your company? And what are you doing in terms of mitigation or minimizing uh, those risks? So I want you to talk around in your tables and mindful of time, I think uh, we will do it again in, in pairs or in, in clusters of three. So you actually do have a time to hear from, from everyone. So again, from, from these from this offset, what is your major risk and what are you doing in terms of mitigating those risks? So a little bit of a beehive and just as a reward, uh, once we've heard from a few people, you will get Fika. 